This excerpt is from the book entitled Elohim the Archetype Original Pattern of the Universe, written by Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, and narrated by Yashuans Giving Glory. This excerpt is called Strong Delusion of Virgin Mary Sent from Yahweh. I will begin. See and read the miracle of Fatima, outside cover, by Rev. J.J. J. Gannon, O.P., but better known by the title of Father J.J. J. Gannon, O.P. See also the story at Fatima in Search Magazine, page 14, April 1959, by Professor J.A. Steikert. See also Our Lady of Fatima, page 207, by William Thomas Walsh. As you read the miracle of Fatima, these things are vitally important to remember, which are as follows. 1. That the man Yahshua the Messiah is the only mediator, not the Blessed Virgin Mary. The Apostle Paul said, For there is one Elohim and one mediator between Yahweh and men, the man Yahshua the Messiah. 1 Timothy 2 and 5 2. Yahweh shall, or rather did in 1917, send them, the papacy, a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they, Pope, priesthood, and laity, all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 11 to 12. 3. Further, we are also told in the story of the miracle of Fatima that in the year of 1960, the sealed message according to Lucia dos Santos from the Virgin Mary will be opened at that time. Until then, it is claimed that only Lucia knows the contents, and speculation is useless. See page 38, Miracle of Fatima. 4. At the same time, 1917, of the occurrence of the strong delusion, or the appearance of the Virgin Mary, the Russian government began to lay plans for its materialistic and political domination and world conquest. We will prove that the miracle of Fatima is a strong delusion, and it was sent of Yahweh, witnessed by approximately 30,000 to 70,000 persons at one time in Portugal. Yahshua the Messiah said, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, which is Yahshua the Messiah, he, not the anti-Messiah or the blessed Virgin Mary, will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have told you. John 14 and 25 to 26 and 1 John 2 and 27. Ten days after his ascension, or on the day of Pentecost, Yahweh did send the Comforter in the name of Yahshua the Messiah, which is the Holy Spirit not a strong delusion. Acts 2 and 1 to 4. See plate number 37 on page 9. A strong delusion or apparition of the Virgin Mary was sent from Yahweh to the Roman Catholic Church worshippers of Mary, Peter and the Pope or the Creator or the creature rather than the Creator, Yahweh Elohim. Romans 1 and 25 because they would not receive the love of the truth which is the Messiah, and not the Blessed Virgin Mary, as was the case described in the miracle of Fatima. Moreover, we will show by the Apostle Matthew and following calculations that Mary is not the mother of Yahweh, but the mother of Yahshua, Matthew 1 and 21, nor was she ever mediator between Yahweh and man, 1 Timothy 2 and 5. The mark of the beast, 666, can also be revealed chronologically on time, indicating that the mystery of iniquity is controlled with unerring accuracy by the divine plan of Yahweh. Dating from the reign of Pope Boniface VIII, the last pope to reign during the 1,260 years of the time of the Gentiles, who died in 1303 A.D. From 1303 A.D. to 1917 A.D., when the miracle of Fatima was revealed, a strong delusion, plus 43 years from the birth of Yahshua by the Virgin Mary, 
to Peter's confirmation of the resurrection of the Messiah, esteemed to be the first pope with the nine years' reign by the wicked King Herod after killing James, Acts 12 and 2, and thinking to put Peter to death after Easter, Passover ends six, six, six years. These facts and figures are taken from the list of popes, Roman Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 15, page 126 and 127, H.G. Wells, Profane History, pages 692 to 693, Catholic Words and Actions, and in the Douay version of the Bible. Our contention is not with the Catholic Universal Church of Yahshua the Messiah or Yahweh, but with the Roman Catholic Church. It was absolutely necessary for Pope Paul VI to make his trip to Fatima, Portugal in October 1967 on the 50th anniversary of the miracle of Fatima to prove that he is that man of sin or the son of perdition, serpent. There is a popular saying that a murderer always returns to the scene of his crime, but there is a more sure way of analyzing all events, and that is according to the scriptures. There is nothing that happens just by chance or accident, but all things happen according to the pattern and purpose and plan of Yahweh, which just repeats itself over and over again. Let us then analyze the Pope's visit to Portugal in the light of previous biblical events. When Moses received his vision in the land of Midian, geographical holy place according to the migratory pattern exodus 3 and 5 he was attending his sheep and beheld an angel in a burning bush who told him that he was to be sent to egypt to free the israelites from the bondage of pharaoh moses was given a sign that this angel would be with him throughout his mission and this sign was demonstrated by moses casting his rod to the ground and its turning into a serpent Moses fled from the serpent, but the angel told him to pick it up by its tail, and when he did, the serpent turned back into a rod in his hand. This same set of circumstances occurs again when Moses went into Mount Sinai and received his vision of the creation of heaven and earth, but the manifestations are a little different. Moses sees Adam in the Garden of Eden with his companion Eve, who is innocent in spirit and mind just as Moses was in the land of Midian with the flock of innocent sheep. Moses sees the serpent in the garden of Eden at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which Yahweh had forbidden Adam to eat of or to touch. And the serpent beguiles Eve, just as Moses was at the burning bush, and the angel told him not to come any closer. And Moses' rod is turned into a serpent which often victimized sheep. Later on, Yahshua the Messiah fulfills these circumstances when he went into the Garden of Gethsemane where there were bushes and trees with his disciples, his companions who were defenseless, and Judas the serpent, and his armed band came into the Garden to apprehend the Messiah. In all of these situations, the same set of circumstances are at work. The man, the woman, the serpent, and the tree. So it was in October 1917, the three little children, a boy and two girls, innocent, received a strong delusion and a vision when they saw an apparition of the Virgin Mary. Remember that the serpent appeared to Eve in the Garden of Eden as a beautiful angel, not as a serpent. Genesis 3rd chapter, Ezekiel 28 and 13 to 20, Isaiah 14 and 12 to 20, Revelation 12 and 9. And these children were in an area where there were trees out in the meadows. Thus, in October 1967, exactly 50 years from the date of the strong delusion, Pope Paul VI, as that serpent, must go to Fatima, Portugal, to the spot where the three little children received their vision. The Pope flew to Portugal by plane, for he is the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2 and 2, then he traveled the rest of the way by motorcade which wound its way through the heavily treed countryside just as a long serpent moves about. This was viewed by millions on TV who were seeing it as from a helicopter flying overhead. 
Please keep in mind that according to the law of Moses, every fiftieth year was the year of Jubilee. Seven times seven equals forty-nine, plus one equals fifty. And the Jews were to sell all of their belongings and free their slaves and were to return to Jerusalem to worship for one whole year. Also, according to biblical historians, it was the year of Jubilee when Judas betrayed Yahshua the Messiah. When Pope Paul VI arrived at Fatima, Portugal, he was met by one surviving member of the threesome, Lucia dos Santos, a woman, and she knelt at the Pope's feet and kissed his ring, and she appeared overwhelmed by his personage, as Eve was of Satan, as the serpent. There was also on display a replica of the tree which was at the spot where the three children saw the apparition in 1917. This train of events proves conclusively that Pope Paul VI is that man of sin, and he was ignorantly fulfilling the will of Yahweh by his words and actions in making his trip to Fatima, Portugal. The Roman Catholics further claim that Yahshua meant by his words recorded in Matthew 16 and 18, and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That Peter was the stone or rock upon which the church of Christ is built. See the book entitled The Unchangeable Church by John Duffy and Premature John M. Farley, D.D., Archbishop of New York, page 71. But Peter himself and Paul both dispute their claim, and the apostles set forth Yahshua the Messiah as the stone, or rock, as Peter wrote, To whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of Yahweh, and precious, ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices which does not mean carnal ordinances or physical sacrifices, acceptable to Yahweh by Yahshua the Messiah. Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, Isaiah 28 and 16 and Genesis 49 and 24. Behold, I, Yahweh Elohim, lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him, the Messiah, shall not be confounded, Unto you, therefore, which, which believe he, the Messiah, is precious, but unto them, Satan and his ministers, which be disobedient, the stone, Yeshua the Messiah, which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them, Satan and his angels, which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. First Peter 2 and 4-8 the Apostle Paul agrees with Peter as he writes, And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Yahshua the Messiah. 1 Corinthians 10 and 4 According to the Roman Catholics' own statements, this would make Peter both foundation stone and also head of the Church of Christ, which leaves the Messiah no place at the foundation or head of his own body, which is the church, Colossians 1 and 24, Ephesians 1 and 22 to 23, and John 2 and 19 to 21. Peter never was a pope, according to his own statement, which reads as follows, The elders, where are among you I exhort, who, whom, who am also an elder, not a pope, and a witness of the sufferings of Yahshua, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. 1 Peter 5 and 1 Wherefore the Roman Catholic Church twist the scriptures and the words of Yahshua and the, apostles, uh, and the apostolistic epistles in order to justify Peter as being a Christ-appointed Pope in their church. They further claim that the Apostle Peter was in Rome instead of Babylon as the head and foundation of their church, dating from A.D. 41 to his death 25 years thereafter, by Nero Caesar in A.D. 67, as stated in The Unchangeable Church by John Duffy and Premature John M. Farley, D.D., page 18. However, this statement cannot be proven in sacred history, 
written by Luke in A.D. 63 or 64, or in the Apostolistic Epistles. Yahshua the Messiah did not tell Peter or any of the rest of them to go and set up in a temple made with hands in Jerusalem, Rome, or any other place in the world for 25 years, as the Roman Catholics say Peter did in Rome. See Understanding the Catholic's Faith, Faith Baltimore Catechism, Number 3, page 24, Reverend John A. O'Brien, Ph.D., LLD, and Premature Edward V. O'Hara, Archbishop, Bishop of Kansas City, August 4, 1954. Herewith, we shall prove that the scriptures do not show that the Apostle Peter was ever in Rome. To the contrary, there is all of the proof that he never went to Rome. Yahshua the Messiah spoke to his disciples before his death, and prophecy to each of them as to what would happen to them in fulfillment of Jacob's prophecy to his twelve sons, while leaning on his staff as to what would befall them. Genesis 49th chapter Yahshua prophesied of Peter thusly, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hand, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify Yahweh. John 21 and 18 to 19 Yahshua the Messiah spoke these words to Peter in direct reference to his, Peter's, being taken or led to Babylon by John Mark, his companion and author of the Gospel according to St. Mark. Peter wrote an epistle from Babylon proving that he did go there, and he spoke thusly, The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, Mark, my son. 1 Peter 5 and 13 The Roman Catholic Church claims that this reference to Babylon means the apocalyptical Babylon referred to by John in the book of Revelations, chapter 17 and 18, and this Babylon denotes Rome, pagan, which was idolatrous and sinful. Well, we say that the Roman Catholic Church has grossly distorted and twisted the truth. Why say that Peter was referring to Rome in the verse above mentioned when he plainly states Babylon? If Babylon means Rome, then Rome means Babylon, and one could say that all the popes reigned in Babylon rather than in Rome. The very nature and disposition or attitude of the Apostle Peter to his going to Babylon, remember that the Messiah said that some would carry him where he did not want to go, John 21 and 18, was in direct fulfillment of the prophet Jonah's reluctance to go to Nineveh and preach the gospel. Yahshua the Messiah referred to Peter thusly, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. John 1 and 42. And in another scripture, Yahshua referred to Peter as Simon bar Jonah. The word bar in Hebrew means the son of, Matthew 16 and 17. The prophet Jonah was a Hebrew, and Yahweh spoke to him and told him to preach unto the Ninevites regarding their wickedness. But Jonah did not want to go. He instead went to Joppa and got aboard a ship which was headed for Tarshish, Tarsus instead to flee from the presence of Yahweh. Yahweh, however, caused a great wind to go over the sea and to cause it to become very turbulent, to the point that everyone on board feared for his life. They, therefore, began to look about for a cause for this turbulence, and when they cast lots, the lot fell on Jonah. He then told them of his flight from Yahweh to keep from going to Nineveh, and he advised them that if they would cast him into the sea, that it would become calm. So Jonah was cast overboard into the sea, and immediately it was calm. But Yahweh had prepared a big fish, which came along and swallowed Jonah, and he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah cried mightily unto Yahweh from the fish's belly, which typified the grave or hell. And Yahweh answered his prayer, and after the three days and three nights, Jonah was spat out upon the dry ground. And he went on down to Nineveh, as Yahweh had ordered him, and preached to the Ninevites, and they repented. Now concerning the fulfillment of this situation regarding Jonah, 
Yahshua the Messiah told the Jews when they asked him for a sign that an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's fish's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 12 and 39 to 40. It is absolutely necessary for us to stop right here and explain these words of the Messiah, for we have not read any commentary, nor have we heard of any theologian who could explain how Yahshua the Messiah was in the heart of the earth grave for three days and three nights, being crucified on Friday and rising from the grave early Sunday morning. When one goes to the law and to the testimony, as we have been admonished, Isaiah 8 and 20, John 5 and 39, and Luke 24 and 44, we find that when Elohim created the heaven and the earth and divided the light from the darkness on the first day, he called the light day and the darkness he called night. Genesis 1 and 3 to 5. The above passage is in the law, and now let us refer to the testimony or prophets Zechariah wrote of the day of Yahweh thusly. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear or dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to Yahweh, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. Zechariah 14 and 6 to 7. Furthermore, under the law we find that the sacrifice of the lamb and the Passover supper took place at night. Exodus 12 and 1 to 8. So then, if Messiah is to fulfill this, he, as the sacrificial lamb, must be crucified or offered up at night. Therefore, it has to turn dark over the face of the earth from the sixth to the ninth hour, twelve noon to three p.m. Matthew 27 and 45, Mark 15 and 33, Luke 23 and 44. The prophet Amos and also prophesied of this day, saying, it, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith Yahweh Elohim, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. Amos 8 and 9 Now, if we will review in sequential order the events of Messiah's crucifixion, taking into account the way that the Jews told the time of day, we would find that sunrise marked the beginning of the daylight hours, 6 a.m. So then it was light or day from sunrise until Messiah was placed on the cross at the third hour, 9 a.m., to the sixth hour, noon. There was a gradual dimming of the light of day to, to corris, correspond with the ebbing away of, Yashu, of Messiah's life. And at the sixth hour, 12 noon, there was complete darkness until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. This was a phenomenal darkness such as was present in Egypt at the time of the plague of darkness, Exodus 10 and 21 to 23. Then from the ninth hour, 3 p.m. until the twelfth hour, 6 p.m., there was the light of the regular day, and at the twelfth hour, when the daylight period would come to an end, then darkness would set in. If, therefore, we designate the light periods of this phenomenal day, known only to Yahweh as a day, and designate the dark periods as night, we find that we have two days and two nights on this one day of Friday. Now, counting Saturday from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. as a day, and from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Sunday as a night, we find that this adds up to the three days and three nights that Messiah was in the heart of the earth. For he resurrected very early on Sunday morning, as the sun was rising toward the dawn of a new day. Now returning to our train of thought regarding Jonah, Messiah, and Peter, we find that after Yahshua the Messiah had risen from the grave, he made eleven different appearances unto the disciples. But it is the third appearance that we want to make reference to now. Peter and six other disciples, seven in all, had gotten into a ship and had gone fishing on the Sea of Tiberias, and had fished all night without catching any fish. John 21st chapter When the morning was come, these disciples saw the resurrected Yahshua the Messiah, in a vision, standing on the shore. 
but they did not recognize him. And he called to them and asked them if they had caught any fish. They answered no, and he told them to cast their net on the right side of the ship and that they would get some fish. Note the night signified the darkness or ignorance of the purpose of Yahweh, which was present before the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Likewise, the left side of the ship signified the same thing. Now, when they cast their net on the right side of the ship, the right side signifies the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. They brought forth a net full of fish, numbering 153 in all. The 153 fish signify the three Pentecosts during the three-year ministry of the Messiah, plus the three days he was in the tomb. Fifty times three plus three equals 153. It was, this mirac it was this miraculous feat that made John recognize the Messiah, and he exclaimed to the rest of the disciples that it was the resurrected Messiah. When Peter heard this, he cast himself into the sea, just as Jonah had been cast into the sea hundreds of years before. Then the seven disciples, dragging their net of fish behind them, the seven disciples and Messiah fulfills the eight that were in Noah's ark and came on over from the antediluvian to the post-diluvian age, came toward the shore, and they saw that Messiah had prepared a big fish which was already cooked over some coals of fire. They were invited by the Messiah to come and dine upon this fish, which was big enough for all of them. And they all did dine and consume the, fi the big fish that Messiah had prepared. This particular event regarding the consuming of the big fish by the disciple was one that had to be fulfilled after Messiah had raised from the grave, for it was not contained in the carnal ordinances given unto Israel. In other words, Yahweh had never commanded Israel to observe the eating of fish in any ceremonial rite. Therefore, the big fish signified the grave or death in hell, Jonah 2 and 2, which swallowed up Jonah, but it had no power over the Messiah, for he triumphed over death, hell, and the grave in his resurrection on the third day. And it was through Messiah's triumph over the grave that the disciples and everyone else is liberated from the bondage of death and sin. Therefore, the disciples were invited to eat and consume the fish, the grave or hell, and death, to signify this triumph which, which was in fulfillment of the prophet Hosea's words, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from the, from the death. O oh, death, I will be thy plagues. O oh, grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Hosea 13 and 14. The Apostle Paul sums up the matter thusly. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? 1 Corinthians 15 and 53 to 55. Please keep in mind that we are primarily interested in showing how Peter fulfilled the same attitude and dis disposition of Jonah. And as Jonah had to go to Nineveh in the region of Babylon, so did Peter go to Babylon rather than Rome, as is stated by the Roman Catholic Church. Seeing that Peter, Simon bar Jonah, was one of the seven disciples who consumed the big fish prepared by Yahshua the Messiah. This is a direct confirmation of Jonah's being liberated from the belly of the fish, or hell or the grave, after which he went on down to Nineveh. So it is right at this point, John 21st chapter, that Messiah began to ask Peter if he loved him, and Peter answered affirmatively, and Messiah asked him the same question three times, and each time that Peter would answer yes, Messiah would tell him to feed his lambs, then feed his sheep, then feed his sheep. The lambs signified the newborn Jews, the sheep signified the fully spiritually matured Jew, and the sheep again signified the Gentiles. This statement of Messiah's, of Messiah to Peter to feed his lamb and sheep meant for Peter to preach the gospel to the Jews and Gentiles, which is just that Yahweh told Jonah to do, and he rebelled or did not want to go.
This is also the point, John 21 and 18 and 19, at which Messiah prophesied of Peter's not wanting to go to Babylon, and of someone, Mark, leading or taking him there, of his eventual death there. Peter later on spoke of his own death in one of his epistles thusly, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as the Messiah hath shewed me. Second Peter 1 and 14 So the Apostle Peter just took off the flesh, or died a natural death in Babylon, where he was preaching the gospel with his son in the faith, John Mark. Peter was not crucified upside down in Rome as acclaimed by the Roman Catholic Church. Peter's death took place about A.D. 66, and this left Mark in Babylon by himself. Now the Apostle Paul did go to Rome, as the Bible plainly states, for he was brought before the, lo the local magistrates and rulers in Jerusalem and Caesarea, to answer the accusations made against him concerning the gospel that he was preaching. And the Spirit spoke thusly to Paul at Jerusalem, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Acts 23 and 11 Notwithstanding, it appeared at one point during Paul's trial at Caesarea that he would not have to go to Rome to appear before Caesarea. But due to the fact that Paul had appealed unto Caesar, he had to go to Rome. King Agrippa, Felix the governor, and Festus the high priest said this in reference to Paul. This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Acts 26 and 31 to 32. It was absolutely necessary for Paul to go to Rome as well as Peter to go to Babylon, in order to fulfill the purpose and plan of Yahweh, as we shall show a little later on in this discourse. Paul wrote his second epistle to Timothy from Nero's palace in Rome, as a footnote in the King James Version of the Holy Bible plainly states, The second epistle unto Timotheus, ordained the first bishop of the church of the Ephesians, was written from Rome when Paul was brought before Nero Caesar the second time. In this epistle, Paul tells Timothy this, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. 2 Timothy 4 and 9 to 11 The apostle Paul, who was in Rome, was plainly telling Timothy to bring Mark, who was with the apostle Peter in Babylon, until his death to Rome with him when he came. Furthermore, Paul does not make mention of Peter being in Rome with him. In his epistle to the Colossians, written from Rome about A.D. 64, he says, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you, Colossians 4 and 14. And in his epistle to the Philippians, written from Rome about A.D. 64, he says, All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. Phil Philippians 4 and 22. This substantially proves that Peter was in Babylon until his death, and not in Rome sitting on a throne serving as a pope, as the Roman Catholic Church claims. Now we will give a chronological account of where the Apostle Peter was during the years A.D. 41 to A.D. 66 that the Roman Catholics claim that he served as pope, and we shall document this by biblical references. A.D. 41 Peter is at Joppa upon a housetop and receives a vision telling him to go to Caesarea and preach unto Cornelius in his household. Acts 10th chapter. Please note that Jonah got on board a ship at Joppa intending to sail to Tarshish. Jonah 1 and 3. From Joppa, Peter goes to Caesarea and then to Jerusalem. Acts 11 and 2. To report to the other brethren of the conversion or grafting in of the Gentiles. AD 43. Peter is in bonds in the old Philippian jail, having been apprehended by Herod, who intended to kill him as he did the Apostle James. Acts 12th chapter. However, Peter is miraculously freed from prison exactly ten years to the day that Messiah was resurrected from the grave, 
to confirm and prove that Messiah's disciples did not come and steal him away from Joseph's tomb, as reported by the unbelieving Jews. It was the same angel, Michael, that affected Peter's delivery from prison as rolled the stone away from Joseph's tomb with Messiah being delivered. AD 52 All of the apostles met in Jerusalem to discuss the matter of the Gentiles' conversion, and the Holy Spirit was also present. Acts 15th chapter Peter spoke at this council of how he had been the first one to preach unto the Gentiles at Cornelius' house in Caesarea in A.D. 40-41. to A.D. 53 According to Luke's testimony, Nero, Claudius Caesar, had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. Acts 18 and 1-2 to And if Peter were there at that time, the commandment of Caesar would have necessitated his departure from Rome because Peter was a Jew, like Aquila and Priscilla. A.D. 66 Peter had been in Babylon for some time with Mark, his companion, and son in the faith, at the time of his death in this year, 1 Peter 5 and 13. These biblical proofs definitely show that the Apostle Peter was not sitting up at Rome acting as the first pope of the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, for him to have done so would have been in direct and flagrant disobedience to the commandment of Yahshua the Messiah, for Yahshua commanded his disciples thusly before he ascended. In being assembled together with them, his disciples, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, ha which saith he, You heard of me, but you shall shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Acts 1 and 4 to 8 Yeshua the Messiah also told his disciples before he ascended, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28 and 19 to 20 It is easy to see, therefore, that Peter was not disobedient to the heavenly vision or to Yahshua the Messiah, and therefore could not and would not have gone to Rome and sit down for twenty-five years on a throne as the Pope rather than out preaching the gospel to the whole world as commanded. Now there remains one further explanation to be made in reference to Peter's going to Babylon, and Paul's going to Rome, and John's going to the Isle of Patmos. If one will consult a map that shows these various regions, he will better understand what is discoursed here. When Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon, he had a dream. Daniel 2nd chapter but when it was finished, he could not remember what it was he had dreamed. He therefore called in all of the wise men, magicians, sorcerers, and astrologers in his kingdom, and asked them to, to tell him the dream with the interpretation thereof, or else they would lose their lives. They hemmed and hauled, but were not able to come up with the dream, so the king commanded that all of the wise men should be slain. Then Daniel stepped forth, and went to the king and asked for time to reveal the dream and its interpretation. And Yahweh made known to Daniel in his house just what the dream and its interpretation were. So Daniel went again to the king and told him that he, the king, had dreamed of a great image whose brightness was excellent, whose head was of gold, whose breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, and his feet part of iron and part of clay. He further told the king that he had, he had seen a stone cut loose out of the mountain, and that it struck this image on its feet, and broke it into pieces as the chaff and the wind carried it away. Then the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. After Daniel had told King Nebuchadnezzar what he had seen in his dream, then he went on to give him the interpretation, which is as follows. The head of the satanic image, gold, was the kingdom of Babylon, with Nebuchadnezzar as its king. This was the first universal dynasty. Babylon would be overthrown, however, and would be replaced by a second kingdom, the combined kingdom of Media and Persia, 
which form the arms and the chest region of the image, silver. The second universal dynasty of Media and Persia would later fall, and be succeeded by a third kingdom, Greece, which is the abominable region of the image, brass. After this, a fourth kingdom would rise and overthrow Greece, and this would be Rome, which forms the thighs, legs, and feet of the image, iron and clay. But this kingdom would be divided into pagan Rome and papal Rome. In the days of this fourth kingdom, Yahweh himself would set up a kingdom, Yahshua, the stone hewed out of the mountain, which would break into pieces these kingdoms and would fill the whole world and reign forever. It was absolutely necessary that this prophetic vision be fulfilled, and it was fulfilled in this manner. Yahshua the Messiah was that stone which was hewn out of the mountain and came down from heaven, tearing down the kingdoms of the world. When the Messiah went into his ministry, he sent his disciples out to preach that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Matthew 10 and 7 And after he had finished his ministry and had been crucified, buried, and resurrected from the dead, his own disciples questioned him, Master, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Spirit is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Acts 1 and 6 to 8. Not many days after this, ten days to be exact, the kingdom did come when the, when the apostles received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. This is an invisible kingdom that does not come by observation. That is, one cannot see it with his eyes, for it is a spiritual kingdom. Luke 17 and 20, Romans 14 and 17. When therefore the apostles went forth into all the world to preach this gospel, as Yahshua the Messiah had commanded them, Matthew 28 and 19 to 20, they were setting up this kingdom of heaven and tearing down the kingdoms of the devil. Now if we will consult our map, we will find that Babylon is the head of this image of a man, and Rome is the foot of this image. The peninsula of Italy, where Rome is located, is even shaped like a foot to unmistakably impart this idea. If one can picture in his mind the image of a man laid out on a map with the head of the image of, in the region of Babylon and the foot of the image of Rome, then one can see how that Peter, or Cephas, meaning stone, would have to go to Babylon to attack this image at the head. The Apostle Paul, that mighty apostle of faith, would have to go to Rome to attack the satanic image at the feet. And the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos in the Aegean Sea would be in the middle portion of this image, these three representing the unity of the Spirit, or the Godhead, fulfilled the prophecy of Daniel with the resurrected spirit of Yahshua the Messiah in them, and overthrew the satanic image. Thus we have proved conclusively, and beyond the shadow of a doubt, that the Roman Catholic Church is lying and distorting the truth when they maintain that Peter was the first pope and ruled at Rome between A.D. 41 in A.D. 66. This excerpt is from the book entitled Elohim the Archetype, Original Pattern of the Universe, written by Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, and narrated by Yashuan's Giving Glory.